Hi, I'm Dave Iker, editor of Astronomy Magazine. Welcome to our eighth Cosmos Rewind Google Hangout, sponsored by Celestron. We're delighted to have Celestron, uh, the telescope company, sponsoring us. Uh, we're in the editors of Astronomy and Discover Magazine's Dissect Each Episode of Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. We're a few minutes late this week. We apologize for that. We had a little technical glitch. But we have a good episode to talk about today. This past week's episode, it was titled Sisters of the Sun. I'm sure most of you saw it. Uh, and it explored our relationship with the stars and a few women who played key roles in our understanding of them. And so we're going to be talking a good deal about th that episode today and about other astronomical matters. And as always, let me introduce our distinguished panel, who we're happy to welcome um, back several editors from the magazines, Corey Powell, the editor-at-large of Discover. Corey, thanks so much for joining us once again. You're back home. I am back home. I'm ready for action. Carrie Farron, the production editor of Astronomy. Carrie, great to have you with us today. Thanks. It's great to be inside and not outside on this very rainy Tuesday. Liz Cruzy, Associate Editor of Astronomy. Liz, thanks for being back with us today. This is an episode you really liked, wasn't it? Of course. <laughs> Stars are good. Yes, for many reasons. <laughs> and myself as well. And I'm going to be taking a little bit more of a moderating role today because I just got back from a big meeting in Washington, D.C., and I had the pleasure of watching the episode uh, all of uh, most of an hour ago for the first time, but I really liked it. It was a good one, and, and so I think there's lots of fun stuff to discuss. And Liz, you're going to start the ball off by giving us an episode summary, are you not? Yes, I am. So uh, the title of this episode, as Dave said, is Sisters of the Sun, and we finally met some women astronomers, the stars that they studied, and the impact that they had on the field of astronomy. Neil Tyson begins in a favorite place of his, under the stars and around a campfire. We've seen that in quite a few episodes. Um, he talked a bit about light pollution and how it blocks out the stars. And then Tyson brought up the idea of humans and pattern recognition. This is a, a theme that we see in many of these episodes. Um, and of course, how this pattern recognition ability enabled humans to survive even with larger and much scarier creatures out there. Um, Tyson then used that as a bridge to the women who cataloged the stars. The Harvard computers, or Pickering's harem, as others have called them, split the light from stars and then studied those spectral, the spectra and their embedded black lines. Annie Jump Cannon led the group that cataloged hundreds of thousands of stars into the sequence OBAFGKM. We were also introduced to Henrietta, Henrietta Leavitt, and I certainly hope that we hear a bit more about her in future episodes, because her story is also extremely important in the, the science that she did. Um, next came Cecilia Payne, a scientist born in Britain who emigrated to the United States to get her graduate degree in astronomy from Harvard. She was the scientist who unlocked the secrets of stellar comp composition. Her PhD thesis, also often, sorry, uh, <laughs> often called the most brilliant doctoral thesis in astronomy, shows that the sun had vastly more hydrogen and helium than heavier elements, which astronomers always call metals. A prominent astronomer at the time, Henry Norris Russell, didn't believe Cecilia Payne's findings, thus she added a sentence to her thesis undermining her discovery. A few years later, other scientists, including Russell, found the same results as her. Uh, Tyson then bridged to the life cycles of stars. All stars are the product of a delicate balance between the pull of gravity inward and the outward push of radiation. Our sun, which fuses hydrogen to helium at its core to produce energy, will run out of hydrogen fuel in several billion years and evolve into a red giant star. Millions of years later, it will spew off its gaseous hydrogen layers and all that will be left behind will be its very dense carbon oxygen core, a white dwarf. Large stars, those at least 10 times as massive as the sun, will undergo supernova explosions at the end of their lives. Some will create neutron stars and others um, that are 30 times more massive than the sun will collapse into black holes. Uh, Tyson then introduced us to the Carina Nebula, where we got to fly through some gas and dust clouds, which is pretty cool. 
The main focus for the next few minutes was Eta Carinae, a binary star with a combined mass well over 100 times the sun's mass. This monster will die in a hypernova, even more powerful than a supernova, in the relatively near future. Um, but don't worry, the star system is 7,500 light years from Earth, so we're safe from any disastrous effects. And of course, no discussion about stellar evolution can conclude without the statement that we're all made of stardust, and that is precisely what Tyson reminded us of at the end, as he has numerous times throughout the Cosmos episodes. <laughs> Nicely said. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Liz. Well, let's, before we get into lots of details about stellar astronomy, uh, what, what was your overall take uh, of this episode? Who, who wants to jump in and sort of, we, we've come a long way back into sort of mainstream astrophysics from a pretty unusual episode a week ago here vis-a-vis -vis astronomy. How, how did this one grab you? Well, here, I'll, I'll jump in. You know, I mean, my background is in uh, history of science and especially history of astronomy. So, you know, seeing these these characters um, who honestly are, are are fairly obscure, even you know, I think even people who know astronomy, uh, a lot of these names are not all that well known. And seeing these these people who are very you know, really pivotal figures who have been, I would say, significantly underappreciated, seeing them, you know, on on national network television. Uh, that's it's, it was very gratifying and very exciting to see, and like I guess I think you know there 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 are many there are many levels to this story. Uh, the fact that that a lot of this real pioneering work was done by people who were laboring relatively in obscurity, doing work that you know on a day to day basis was extremely difficult and tedious. Uh, you know, this was not glamorous work, but this you know this is sort of this is sort of the ugly side of science that you know that. It, these the, the three women who uh, Liz Chrissy was describing did the type of the type of really hard nuts and bolts work, which, as I was saying, it's it's not always very glamorous, but it was the foundation of so many other things that we know about the universe today, of understanding the scale of the universe and how stars evolve, and, and all all these ideas of of where we came from, everything. I mean, the idea of the Big Bang is all built on on this research. So. Like I said, it was very exciting to see these people who, who did the foundational work that's not that's often not talked about a whole lot, and to you know, to get a chance to see their stories, hear their stories, um, and as we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along, the specifics of their stories are also you know kind of interesting, kind of unusual, and very socially significant. Yeah, I agree. I oh go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> I, I really like this episode. Um, I thought it was nice to go back to the core of Cosmos, if you will, which is astronomy. And then I liked it was a great balance between history, and it was obviously fantastic as a female to see, you know, some stories of female characters that played a pivotal role in astronomical history. Um, and then it had a nice, you know, a nice balance of history and then what we know currently about stars and dealing with stuff that very much interests the general public. Obviously there's so many areas you could talk about um, in stellar astrophysics, but to talk about you know the sun, which is our star and what a lot of people truly are interested in the fate of the sun and you know, or you know, fate, future of the sun, and also the really obviously cool um, areas of stellar astrophysics, which is the concept of you know, a hypernova, you know, a bigger bang than a supernova. I mean, that's something that's maybe not that well known, but it's it's one of it could become a you know supernova for us in astronomy is a buzzword, if you will, and so a hypernova would be even more. So it was it was a really interesting um, mix. I enjoyed honestly every minute minute of it. I could nitpick things, but overall just really enjoyed it. My husband really enjoyed this episode. Um, he kind of was waiting for a core astronomy episode, so he really liked it, even though he is not in astronomy. Um, and then I, I even liked the intro, which is was a nice throw to, you know, it's sad that we're, we've come to so un, much understand stars, and yet we can't really see them anymore. And the problem that is light pollution, and you know, you know, I could t I've written in other magazines about light pollution, and I mean, you could spend 
all kinds of time talking about the problems with light pollution and how sad it is that kids these days, until they, unless they really go like rural camping, no, don't have never seen the Milky Way, the band of the Milky Way, um, and that as we're learning more and more about stars, we're we're losing them. And um, I like that intro because we've brought them down to Earth, which we have. We are star stuff, but at the same time, um, at least acknowledging the problem with light pollution, I appreciate it. Liz, what did you think? I really, I liked the episode um, for all the reasons that Corey and Carrie have already stated, but it it's great to see the history of the science, how people came about their discoveries, the big players in it, um, especially shedding light, I guess pun intended there, mm-hmm. on the, <laughs> on the, you know, the, the people who aren't as well known. Um, and of course, there's also the, the social aspect, which um, I think is very interesting, and astronomy in general has come a tremendous way since, um, you know, 80, 90 years ago in that respect, just like every field, but uh, what most, yeah, I thought it was a great episode, Um, I liked all the the bridges, I know sometimes we kind of wonder if, why he's jumping around so much, um, why Neil Tyson is within an episode, and I think this one flowed really nicely, Um, and there were little teasers, especially the Etta Carine teaser, and then they go to commercial break and talk about something else, and you're like, wait, wait a minute. But we came back to it pretty quickly. Um, it didn't take, you know, half an hour to get back to it. So, so yeah, I overall really liked the episode. You know, before we get into the substance of, of a lot to talk about here, and we have a lot of science to talk about and some social issues, frankly, as well, of course, let's, talk, let's just get a little talk in, Carrie and, and others, about light pollution, because, as you say, for the entirety of human history and our our ancestors for a couple of million years now we've had uh, beings walking around looking up at the moon and stars able to easily see uh, essentially the whole night sky until about a century ago uh, maybe a little bit more than that what does that do to, to the sort of relationship between humans and the universe and is there anything that we can do other than support Scott Cardell and the International Dark Sky Association to try to really give an appreciation of the universe to most people. And most people now, you know, many people live in cities, of course, by necessity, but but they're kind of missing out on part of that appreciation of what makes you human now, aren't they? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's really sad. I mean, I even think about, you know, obviously I'm fairly young, so, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't see the band of the Milky Way until I was probably, I was probably six or seven, and I mean, it was just, it was, awe-inspiring. I just, the fact that, you know, I lived in the suburban area near a golf course. It was pretty dark. I could see, I could see the Pleiades um, from my backyard, but, and I was one of those ones when I was really little, thought I was finding the Little Dipper, and then realized as I got older that, no, I was seeing the Pleiades and not the Little Dipper, Um, but it, it can have such an impact. I don't think part of our problem with kids not necessarily relating to astronomy or science in general is they're not experiencing it firsthand. And I think losing the stars and not really noticing them anymore is a big deal because you barely see them. And so I, if a few things I always like to tell people is, one, please, if you are parents, take your kids camping. Go dark, get out, like, and I'm not saying go a half an hour out of the city, I'm saying go, like, for me, my parents took me up into the north woods in Wisconsin, um, and if you can go even farther, you know, go to the desert southwest, and if you can truly go far, go to Australia, go to the outback, see the stars, see what, you know, we're losing with city lights, and then you can't, obviously, something that um, Scott Cardell has taught me, I've done a few stories with him, is that you can't just teach by um, telling, you have to set an example for your neighbors, even if it's small things about using full cutoff lights and, you know, doing your own things to fight about against light pollution. You can't tell everyone, oh, it's so sad that we lose the night sky and then have the lights in your front yard that are very pretty, but, like, send lights straight up. You have to, you know, you have to set an example for your neighbors. Um, and also, you know, it gets a little political, but it's it's talking to... Um, the local council people to explain that it's not only a night sky issue, it's economics, it's wasteful energy, and it's safety, because a lot of times um, there's a stunning 
image that the um, International Dark Sky Association uses and Scott Cardell uses that actually so much glare from lights can actually help um, burglars hide and because you can't see them because your your eyes aren't dark adapting and um, it's actually really stunning so yeah educate yourself and then educate others there's there are things we can do there will always be city lights as a necessity but we could at least reduce our impact okay I'll get off my soap box now. <laughs> yeah well, uh, well I, I, look I think there's 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 one I mean a very important point uh, at the at the end there which is that you know Controlling light pollution doesn't mean getting rid of outdoor lighting. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in, you know, in many ways, it, it means the opposite. It means improving energy efficiency. It means you know, actually having better lighting in you know, in, in parking lots and outdoor spaces. Uh, so you know, it's not like these. It's not like the the you know, the, the practical needs and the and the, the, you know, the and, and the sort of the philosophical needs of, of are at, at odds with each other. Um, I do think there's a there's also just kind of a larger I mean, there's a larger issue here of just, of, you know, there's a message that, you know, we in the media need to get out and that, um, you know, I think to the, you know, as far as, you know, people in the movies and TV, you know, organizations like the Science and uh, Entertainment Exchange can get out, it's a very simple message, which is look up. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, you don't even need a dark sky. I, I can't tell you how many adults I've seen who are amazed that you can see the moon during the daytime. Um, or, or you know, or, or you know, you or you point out planets, and they're like, we can see planets, and you know, you don't need a dark sky to see planets. Uh, you know, I'm I'm in Brooklyn, and I have you know, e even here, you can see Jupiter and Mars perfectly fine, um, and yet people are astonished when I when I tell them what I'm looking at. Like, really? I didn't know you could see those things. You know, it's just you know, I think you you have to start with the with the with the wonder of the universe, and you know, that's why I'm glad to see. Cosmos is why I'm glad to be here as part of this conversation, uh, because I think you know it, it happens in little incremental steps. You know, people understand that they want their kids to see mountains and see streams and to see forests and to sort of experience nature. Um, and so I think you know we just need to keep repeating this message that there's also this there's this other nature, the other half of the world that if you just lift your head up, you see these incredible things, even if you're in a city. You, you know, even if you're even if it's the middle of the day. Uh, you see incredible things, and and it's part of this you know, incremental process of re of reminding ourselves that we are part of something bigger and grander and really very exciting. And it was Carl Sagan who used to say repeatedly that you know ninety nine percent of people are born and and grow up and live their lives and die without understanding their place in the universe, and and that was forty years ago when light pollution, frankly, was much less worse than, than it is today. And Corey, what you said is really critical because good lighting is actually cheaper as well. Um, so it's making that transition to not be wasteful and be blasting photons skyward everywhere, which doesn't do anyone any good, um, and saving a lot of money and a lot of energy and, and with a greener, uh, more healthy planet here. That's where we need to go, but it's it's tough, isn't it? It's a challenge, and and uh, but it goes hand in hand. Doing what's right for the economy and for the planet also goes hand in hand with uh, being uh, enabling people, more people, to see and understand the universe around us. And I just have to add, Corey, you're exactly right. I was stunned. I was at uh, a year ago now or so to one of the fall stargazes with the Amateur Astronomers Association in Central Park, and they had telescopes set up, but you never would have guessed ever in my life, as many times as I've been to New York City, that you could set up a four-inch telescope and look at the Andromeda Galaxy in the middle of Central Park. It's, yeah. it's staggering, but, <laughs> but you can't. Really remarkable. So you're absolutely right. I mean, you can see a lot more than you'd think you would. Um, in a light polluted setting, but we we want we want uh, everyone to really see more than a handful of those 400 billion stars that are in the Milky Way, if possible, so they can appreciate that and understand it. But let's step back into the core of things here for a moment, um, and we've got a really amazing uh, group of female astronomers um, here in the early part of the 20th century at Harvard. 
uh, working for EC Pickering, and, and they were involved in crucially important advances in understanding stars and therefore understanding also the universe in a larger context. The classification scheme of stars, the period luminosity relationship of certain special types of stars and therefore the distance scale of the galaxy, uh, relating spectral classifications of stars to, to stellar temperatures and understanding then the life uh, 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 the, the life's uh, systems of, and, and, and uh, um, systems of stars. Uh, lots and lots of important things they were involved with this, that came out of this research. And let's just cut to the chase, though. They were there because they were cheap. They were getting paid uh, around 30 cents an hour, and uh, it, it was really uh, an exploitation of those young, educated ladies getting paid at the time uh, uh, unskilled wages in order to do some of the greatest astrophysical astronomy uh, science of the early uh, 20th century. How do you guys feel about that? And particularly Liz and Carrie, how do you feel about that as women? I'm glad they, they get their due eventually. Um, yeah, it's I, I had read somewhere that the amount that they were getting paid was less than um, essentially an administrative assistant down the hall who was not doing scientific research. Um, so it's it's pretty shocking um, in one respect, but I guess at the same time, uh, that's I mean, we've come a long way and we know that things were a lot different back then. Um, Obviously, there are still concerns amongst people regarding um, equal pay still between men and women. I don't think it's nearly as bad as it was, you know, 80 years ago. Um, but We're paying you more than 30 cents, aren't we? For sure. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know what inflation makes that into these days. Um, but, but, yeah, it, it, it was nice to see an episode focus on um, the great science they did and not because they were getting paid to do it, but because they wanted to do it and they had the ability to do so. Um, and I, I think it, it just shows what drive and what a love of the sky and love of science can do. Um, so, I mean, being a scientific researcher is certainly not the most glamorous position that someone can hold nowadays, but that's not why people do it. Um, I don't think it ever has been why people do it. So. I was just really excited just to see it because I think obviously there are plenty of stories of you know uh, women in the workplace um, around that time and you know dealing with the challenges. But yeah, this wasn't this isn't the most common story as Corey had said when he was talking about it. Even in astronomy, um, I for example I was watching it with my husband and you know he had never heard of these women and even I had to admit I learned something I, I knew exactly obviously who Cecilia Gapain was but I did not realize that the reason she came over from Britain was because she was not allowed to do research in her home country um, and so I, that was something I learned and it was just I mean yes they dealt with a lot of challenge but seeing their passion and that technically their passion you know could make a dis difference because um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but Cecilia Payne did become a full professor. It took a long, long time. time. <laughs> but I mean, and, yeah, she, 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 did, she, she, yeah, she became sorry. She she became a full professor in 1956, okay. and she was the first female professor at Harvard. Yeah. And she then became the first the first woman to to head a department at Harvard. Um, but that 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 statistic did did rather amaze me. Yeah, and so I mean, and but as you say, it takes it takes that experience to get Liz and I to where we are today. Um, so it's just, it's very nice to see and I'm really excited that so many more people um, than just, you know, your core people who are interested in stellar astrophysics or really interested in maybe women's studies, the greater public hear their stories. It was really, it was really great to hear. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we, of, we often hear the, that phrase, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And you know, usually when you hear that, you think of you know of Isaac Newton or or gets applied you know forward to to, to Einstein or or you know one of the one of the great famous characters uh, in the history of science. But you know that that standing on the shoulders of giants aspect, you know, is a much it's a it's a much broader phenomenon. And what I thought was interesting about the story is that that, that here it applies 
socially as well as scientifically. You know, here you had a you know a group of of primarily women astronomers uh, working under E.C. Pickering at Harvard, um, doing this very this very difficult, very time intensive work. And these were, you know, and they were unusual characters. Um, Any Jump Cannon uh, was was deaf since childhood from from scarlet fever. Um, Henrietta Swan Leavitt uh, also also actually went deaf in her twenties. Um, so you know you have these two women who are you know who are deaf, who never married, who devoted themselves to this very unusual, very intensive, very low paid work. In fact, uh, Hen Henrietta Leavitt uh, was not paid at all for a while. She she had some personal income, and so it wasn't even basically it wasn't worth her while to take the to take the income. And I think it, it kind of you know it it helped the project along, and so she was in fact earning zero for a, for a lot of the time that she was working there. But you know these people persevered, and so you know and there's a lot of other work that you know in the sort of shoulders of giants style it was built on what they did. And also, as you say, you know there's a lot of social change that you know you know all of them, but I think you know I mean Cecilia Payne in particular really pioneered the idea of women in academia. Of you know of you know of opening opening these doors and you know and look you know here's UC Pickering at Harvard on the one hand you know he's realizing that he can get some cheap labor and he can get some very you know very hardworking people who have you know secretarial skills that turn out to be very useful for a certain type of astronomy research on the other hand you know he was a progressive in the sense that you know nobody else was opening that oppor you know was creating that opportunity so you know the you know social change like Scientific change, you know, it happens incrementally. Uh, but this, it's great to remember, you know, you know who the people are that brought us here and, and what they did. One thing too that I I, I don't know where this is going to fit in this conversation, and I've mentioned this to Carrie already. Um, but the episode I think treated women in astronomy in a very um, kind of even keeled way, as in uh, there were no. They just Tyson described their abilities and nothing more than their scientific abilities. But the way that Fox Network described it, um, this episode in their uh, schedule on their website, had nothing to do with Cecilia Payne's ability. They called her a British beauty instead of, you know, a brilliant scientist. Um, it was purely based on her appearance, which I kind of take offense to because in, in that respect, um, yeah, hey, let, let's say for the record, Neil Tyson is a handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Does anyone say that? <laughs> no one says, like, in the description, handsome Neil Tyson discusses this. No. Or what about William Herschel? Exactly. Yeah. Handsome I, Herschel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they were what they were doing is they were obviously hyping up the fa fact that Cosmos has, throughout these past episodes, occasionally had um, a famous... Um, Actor uh, voice um, certain of their car their cartoon characters in this uh, Kirsten Dunst was the uh, voice of Cecilia Payne and and that's fantastic that's great I appreciate you you know that these very famous actors want to do these voices but yeah the calling her a beauty was just like no <laughs> a man totally wrote that I'm sorry a man totally wrote that. Well, and not only did they influence the science of the day, of course, in an extraordinary way, but we're talking about cultural change and the opportunities for women taking a long time. But this was a breakthrough moment with regard to astronomy in the a milestone in history. But, I mean, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, she, she also, we can look at how they influence things at their time and later on as well. I mean, among her doctoral students were Frank Drake, Joe Ashbrook, Paul Hodge, and Helen Sawyer Hogg, uh, and you know there are a lot of very important people who she influenced, who carried things on, and and were another generation of great astronomers thanks to her, after her uh, main core work as well. Um, and these are all people who we, you know, I mean, you know, either know them or met them or, or you know, and knew them when they were around. So I mean, this is. You know, there's an incredible effect uh, from this social change that spreads outward and influences lots of other people's lives, even insofar as the research goes, which is really cool, too. Right. I'd like to put in a, a particular plug. We've sort of been dancing around the specifics of the, of the science that they did, 
And I want to put in a particular plug for, for Henrietta Swan Livet's science uh, because basically, essentially what she, what she figured out, uh, she did this, the, the, the very laborious work to figure out that there are certain types of variable stars um, called Cepheid variables that, that whose period of variation is related to their intrinsic brightness. So basically what that tells you is you, you, take a, you could just take a series of photos of, let's say, a, you know, a galaxy or a field of stars. You watch some of these stars get brighter and dimmer, and just by how long it takes them to get brighter and dimmer, you know how bright they are, and then in turn you know how far away they are. Um, so, I mean, that, that one, that, that, that little, you know, that, that little step, that led to being able to map this, the shape and scale of the Milky Way. That led to Edwin Hubble being able to prove the existence of other galaxies. Uh, and the next step, that led to Edwin Hubble being able to demonstrate that the universe is expanding, or, or you know, he developed the redshift law, which we now understand to mean that the universe is expanding. Um, so with you, a you, slifer in there too. Pardon? With a slifer in there too. Yes, with 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 with, Vesta, with Vesta slifer in there. Another guy who does not get enough credit. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, we can we can come back to Vesta slifer in a minute because I love Vesta slifer. Um, but but so you know, so you know we have you know you know, this this toolbox. I mean, what was really coming out of Harvard was you know a, was a toolbox. For other researchers, and this toolbox led to the mapping of the galaxy, proving the existence of other galaxies, proving the existence of the, the expanding universe, and that led directly to the to the Big Bang and really the whole modern map of cosmology. Uh, you know, the tools that came out of there are still the fundamental tools of understanding the the distance scale and really in the, the age of the universe. So you know, it's one of these things. You know, you you start with one little thread, and it and it weaves and it weaves and it weaves, and you have this. Well, I guess tapestry would be the where the metaphor is going. Uh, you know, you, you have this this picture of the universe that all comes out of uh, you know the this sort of you know these this sort of charts and tables type work that was going on at Harvard. You suddenly have the ability, the opportunity to investigate all the interrelated facets of cosmology from this one breakthrough understanding of hers, which is really incredible. I know we're we're, we're on that here. And then, okay, okay, so here, so so I'll jump in and and uh, and uh, put in a word for for Annie Jump Cannon too, so, so that she doesn't get short shrift here, um, because you know th then you know you know boy you know talk about you know a, a clerical task, basically you know, the task of classifying different types of stars and looking for patterns of you know what what makes this star kind of like this star, what makes that star kind of like that star, and what is the difference between them? Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's esoteric work, and it's very tedious work of just looking at the spectra of tremendous numbers of stars and trying to find patterns and trying to find a classification scheme. Uh, but that scheme turned out to be, uh, basically it was a way of, of what, what she was doing, which was mapping the temperature of, of different stars and you know, the physical conditions on the different stars, and that in turn turned out to be the key to classifying how stars evolve and, and, and why low-mass stars are different than high-mass stars and where our sun fits into this. And so, you know, all this, this idea that, you know, we, you know, someday our sun is going to turn into a red giant, someday our sun is going to turn into a white dwarf, we kind of know where, where our sun came from, we know where how the stars form. You know, all of these big stories all emerge from these these core underlying ideas, and that and any jump cannon was really right smack in the middle of that of, of solving that problem of what are what do you you know when you look at different colors of stars and different different you know different you see different things when you put their their light through a, a spectroscope what does that mean and she was the one who really started putting that idea together. Thoughts, Liz? Do you have? Any, let's I talk about the. Let's talk about spectral types of stars a little okay. bit and what they mean. Yeah. So um, I thought this might be a good transition into sort of the history of that. Um, some people were curious as to where these weird letters come from. The O B A F G K M. Um, yes, I'm girl, kiss me. 
Yes, that is the mnemonic that people remember, if you guys heard that. Um, Maybe so, do it slowly again. Okay. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Or guy. <laughs> she said girl. Whichever one you go for. Girl, so that's what I go with. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's how astronomers remember them. Uh, now they know that O stars are the hottest and the bluest stars. B are a little more white than blue. A are white stars. F are sort of a white yellow. G are yellow. K is more of an orange and M are red. Um, where blue is hottest, red is coolest. Um, the original sequence started out as alphabetical A, B, C, D, E, F, G for 22 letters, where A had the strongest hydrogen lines. Um, so I'm also going to do a nice screen share, which I see Carrie was about well, to Well, I was going to do it, but then you kept talking. So. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going through it. I don't know if you can see my cursor on this, too. Um, but they cat originally, Will William... Williamina Fleming came up with it. Um, so A stars had, this is one of the hydrogen lines here. Another hydrogen line is here. And so um, if you look at the A stars, they have much stronger hydrogen lines. And then the B stars, and it went down the cycle. Um, what uh, Andy John Cannon realized was that it probably has to do with temperature instead of um, instead of these hydrogen lines being, it, having that be the order, instead have temperature be the order. So she rearranged them to, away from the alphabetical, only kept seven of them, if I can add now, yeah, seven of them, I'm glad I can add, uh, and rearranged them in terms of temperature, although they didn't know why it would have anything to do with temperature, which is where Cecilia Payne came in. Um, and then she kind of, as we saw in the episode on Sunday or yesterday or earlier today, um, she was the one who sort of determined the differences uh, between the temperature and why O stars are hotter than M stars or, or why those spectral are from hotter um, stars. And I'd, I'd like to jump in and, and, and give a, a shout out to my, my college thesis advisor, uh, Owen Gingrich, who uh, every year challenges his students to come up with a mnemonic for the for this stellar classification scheme. So anyway, so so you know, you're reading off you know it's it so the the letters representing the different types of stars turned into this funny funny jumble um, and I'll repeat you know that so the, the standard mnemonic that, that you used to learn in in uh, astronomy classes is oh be a fine girl kiss me. So he decided that it, you know, it was time to modernize this. So he tried he asked his students to come up with other ideas and one of them was only boys accepting feminism get kissed meaningfully. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was sort of a, a, a nice little, uh, nice yeah. little, a nice yeah. little twi twist around. Um, yeah, look, I mean, the, the you know the, the I mean the alphabet soup doesn't really matter. The thing that, the thing that matters is that we have that classification scheme, um, and that you know an, an O star is a blue star that's very hot, it's very massive, lives a very short and catastrophic life. An M star is a very small star, a very cool star. It conserves its energy and lives maybe trillions of years. People aren't even really sure exactly how long they live because it's way longer than how old the universe is so far. Being able to tell that story, being able to know the lifetimes of stars and that stars have lifetimes, that they have you know, personal narratives kind of the way, you know, the way humans do, uh, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's another... As, you know, it's another. It's another step in really the, the personalizing of the universe. That we start to you know we start to go from the ancient idea of you know tell you know telling our own stories and projecting them onto the stars to this modern idea that you really want to know their own stories. You want the story of the universe and bring that down to earth. And to me, that's you know that's uh, that, that's probably the most exciting theme running through cosmos. And I was just going to say I was going to show a visual. It's kind of well, it's near and dear to my heart because um, along with our former graphic designer who's now at Discover, actually, um, Allison Mackey, we um, created a um, kind of a visual of a lot of what um, these women kind of figured out. And 
I'm hoping my screen is sharing at the moment. Is it? Now it is. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, and so it was, you know, so we created this cool diagram that kind of did the colors of the sky and why they relate to temperature. And obviously they didn't want to get, you know, we have this nice the oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, because that's what I'm going to stick with. Um, you know, temperature graded scale, so you could see it nicely, and then actually how big the B section actually is of tech, of B type stars are of temperature, but also obviously they weren't going to get into extensively, um, as Liz and I talked about before this, necessarily what, why we understand these temperatures and why they relate to color, which is a concept of um, black body ra radiation, but it's, it's, it's a great visual and to understand, you know, it's crazy that such a simple concept of color slash temperature can tell us so much about um, these stars. And so it was kind of one of the my favorite things I learned in astronomy, which is why I did this kind of graphic, or I asked Dave if I could do this graphic. Um, so personal plug, but yeah, take some time, look up black body radiation and star colors, and it's it's really amazing what you'll learn. So personal throw out. <laughs> yeah, stars are pretty awesome pieces of information, I guess. Once you observe it and you look at their color, you can figure out their temperature immediately. You can figure out their mass. Um, and then looking at their surroundings, if they're in a cluster or, um, you know, if it's you can sometimes figure out their age. You can plug that information into computer models to figure out how they're going to evolve or what their early history was like. It's it, it's pretty cool, especially with pulsating stars, um, different types of variable stars. If you only know a few things about them, there are computer simulations that astronomers have created using decades of observations. You can plug in the known facts, the things that you see, and get a whole lot more information about those stars out just by knowing a couple things. So. They're pretty, pretty nifty tools. Yeah, and actually, I think that's that's another observational thing that a lot of people don't realize is that you can actually look up and see star colors, uh, and you kind of have to train yourself to be sensitive to it. But you know, in the winter, you can look at Orion and notice that you know Betelgeuse is really a very different color than Rigel, or you know, in the summer, you know, Vega and Arcturus and Antares, you know, the, the, these. These stars are, are distinctly different colors. And, you know, once you, again, it's one of those things, you know, once you train yourself to notice it and you just look up, you know, I, you know, here I am, I'm living in Brooklyn often, you know, if I'm, if I'm walking home and, it, and it's, you know, the, the street lights are blazing and I'm between buildings, you know, I can only see one or two stars in the sky, but at a glance I know which stars they are because every star has a personality. And you know there is something fun. Uh, you know you don't you don't need a pitch black sky. You don't need to be in the country to have that sense of the personality of the universe. But you can't see the Milky Way's band from the city, and no. the Milky Way's band is just one of the most awesome things to see in the sky. So yeah, that that is that is something. Uh, and, and again, you know, you know, I think this this showed up uh, some of the visuals in this this last episode of Cosmos uh, of imagining you know you know. Seeing you know, seeing galaxies from the outside, and seeing you know, you know, th these incredible views of galaxies. I think, well, actually, we have a pretty incredible view of our own galaxy. We just don't get to see it most of the time. Yeah. You, know, you, you don't you don't need to wait you know billions of years or imagine distant worlds of, of wouldn't it be incredible to see what that sky looks like? It would be incredible to see our sky if you could actually see it. One of the things that you don't need a perfect sky to see in the winter Milky Way is the Pleiades star cluster. Neil started talk, the episode talking about the Pleiades, which if you can find above and to the left of Orion is Taurus, um, or right, I'm sorry, um, and the constellation Taurus, and it consists essentially of two bright star clusters and a number of other bright stars. The V-shaped Hyades, that's a very large star cluster quite close to us, and then also the little dipper-shaped Pleiades star cluster. It's about 400 light-years away, and, and those are relatively young suns. Well, 
the sun, our sun, let's talk about the sun and what's going to happen with it in the future, our star, it was born in a star cluster, of course, uh, originally, about 4.6 billion years ago. And the, that star cluster has long ago been dispersed by the galactic tide because the rotation about the galactic nucleus will tear things apart eventually over time. Um, but uh, we know that in about another five billion years or so, the sun will become a red giant because we understand, thanks to stellar evolution and these studies that we've talked about, uh, we understand where the sun is going in its life and where it is along its evolutionary path. Uh, it'll become a planetary nebula, um, as most stars uh, of uh, medium mass do. Uh, if you set the the red dwarfs aside and the really small number of really heavy stars, so let's talk about uh, planetary nebulae and what will happen to and the red the red giant stage uh, before the planetary nebula and what will happen to the inner solar system. We have a number of questions about that. What's going to happen ultimately to Earth and to Mercury and to Venus uh, when the sun goes red giant? They're going to get fried. He didn't say, he said Earth would probably be okay, but um, I've read some pretty recent studies, and we actually had one um, published an article very recently in our February issue about a recent study um, that Mercury, Venus, and Earth would get fried, basically, from the sun's outer atmosphere. One thing he didn't, Neil didn't explain extraordinarily well is the core of the, the sun is only about 10% at most of the star's volume. Outside of that is this diffuse envelope of gas. Um, I mean, it's not extraordinarily diffuse, but it's far more or far less dense than the core. And that stuff, a lot of it, that outer atmosphere is going to be spewed off. Um, during the red giant in later stages because the star, our sun will go through some pulsations and throw some of that material off. And that material is going to collide with, I mean, it's going to overtake Mercury and Venus and Earth. The four outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, their orbits are actually going to be flung farther out because all of a sudden they're going to be orbiting a star that doesn't have one full solar mass of material anymore because it's lost a bunch of it. Um, and then uh, Mars, it, it sounds like scientists aren't quite sure what's going to happen to Mars, sort of in the delicate balance of whether it's going to be saved um, or whether it's going to be you know, eaten by the sun. Although, Corey, you look like you're not entirely convinced of this, so... <laughs> Oh well, I'm 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 just thinking about the the path the path along the way that because the you know the sun is getting brighter now it's getting brighter gradually now and then uh, then things really uh, heat up in about in about five billion years but along the way um, there's gonna be a there's gonna be a time in maybe a, a, you know a couple billion years when temperatures on Mars are gonna be a lot nicer than they are now and then you wait a little bit longer and actually you know Jupiter's moons uh, you know Europa will we'll get Earth-like temperatures, and then Titan will get Earth-like temperatures around Saturn. And I think at the peak, uh, it'll get to the point where actually Pluto will become a, uh, well, depending on what it actually looks like, it'll become a sort of a habitable temperature uh, world at the peak of the, of the sun's red giant phase. So, you know, you can imagine that, uh, that you know, some, some planet-hopping future civilization can uh, you know every every few hundred million years just kind of relocate <laughs> to another part of the solar system, um, but yeah, the the Earth as a habitable planet, even if even if some physical bit of the Earth remains, which as you say is is a questionable proposition, uh, whatever's left over is not going to be uh, not going to be much going on there. No, because it's actually less than a billion years that Earth will have boiled off. Uh, on Earth, all the water in the oceans will boil off because of the sun's increasing uh, radio, ra increasing output of energy, bolometric magnitude, um, 800 million years-ish, and at that point it'll be a cinder long before the red giant effects. So you'll have to either give it up or move uh, in less than a billion years, but, you know, that's a long time from now. Lots of time to plan. Lots of time to plan. Yeah. But, you know, if you want to sell your real estate cheap, I'll buy <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, when the sun does, before we get on to more exotic and fun things like exploding stars, 
Um, when the sun does uh, go past the red giant phase, it'll it'll eventually, as we've talked about, I think in a hangout before already, uh, will sort of belch off these layers um, that are moving very slowly uh, of the gas that remains and create this glowing planetary nebula for about 50,000 years or so, and then some higher velocity material will come out um, after the planet. Terry Nebula is formed and creates shock fronts and, and it'll glow and like the Ring Nebula or the Helix Nebula or all those favorite things we like to look at in our telescope. So we'll eventually be inside a planetary nebula for a short time of a few tens of thousands of years and then it'll really be an interesting place to be. And that leads into another question. Uh, before we get on to massive stars, and we'll kind of end with that because we're going to go uh, because we started late until about 10 after the hour. But there was a question uh, here that rolled in about what is going on in the middle of the galaxy and really far out on the edge and where we are and where's the safest and most, where's the most interesting place to be in our galaxy? And it depends on what you mean by interesting. <laughs> the, uh, the most interesting place is probably the exact opposite of the safest place. Exactly. I think yeah. The most yeah. interesting place it's probably uh, be right, right in the center, right next to the the, the big black hole in Sagittarius yeah. A star. Yeah, those uh, stars that are over it. Yeah. That's yeah, being right next to a giant black hole, I would find that very interesting. <laughs> I would find that very safe. I would find that very interesting. <laughs> I think in terms of, in terms of safety, uh, you know, being probably being out on the fringes is is not a not a bad place to be. Uh, um, you know, sort of the, the fewer other stars there are around, the less likely you are to have a a nearby supernova, so you know, being in a, a you know a boring halo star or off on the edge, um, you know, not much is going on there. But you know, that's it's sort of a safe place. You know, it's it's like life. Uh, you know, the the more interesting it is, the riskier it is. <laughs> and a blatant plug, um, because I'm really good at these. Uh, if you want to wait. Just one month, um, as we send it to print this week, um, you know, a pretty interesting place to live would be in a globular cluster. And that's actually the cover story of our July issue, which is on newsstands next month, to see what it would be like to be living on a planet in a globular cluster that's in the halo of the Milky Way. So... And Neil touched on that at the very end. I know. Of very, very so very not... Yeah, with uh, the amount of structure you'd see in the Milky Way if you're kind of floating above it, um, and then you could see all the little star-forming regions. You wouldn't have the dust blocking this disk. I mean, right now, the sun is embedded in one of the arms. And so it's like trying to, what's the expression? Trying to determine the forest from the trees when you're embedded in it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's been a little more difficult for astronomers to figure out the the structure, but they've done it by using radio observations, infrared observations to sort of peer through that dust. And if you were above the entire uh, Milky Way, you could definitely make out the structure a lot better. But it, just to, uh, to to finish answering the the uh, the, the question that you that uh, that that's, that somebody sent in for the hangout, some scientists have actually tried to map what they call the, the galactic habitability zone. There are certain parts of the galaxy that are better suited to life than others. Um, because in the, you know, the, the innermost part of the, of the galaxy, the stars are packed much more closely together. Uh, uh, the, you know, the stellar population on the whole is older. So you don't have, you don't have as many young stars and young planets. Um, you don't... Um, you, you have... Um, sort, of, you know, sort of less, less raw material for making for making new worlds, uh, and you also are things are packed together more tightly. There there there's a, a higher risk of being in a basically in a in a high radiation incident like a supernova. So, you know, honestly, where we are in the Milky Way seems to be a pretty good location. And you could argue again, this is maybe you know maybe this is you know another anthropic argument that that we're in the part of the galaxy where that just that happens to be good for life because if we if we weren't in the part of the galaxy that was good for life, we wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> we don't know enough to know if that's really true, but but it's a, it's an interesting speculation. 
and by the way, if you were in a globular cluster, you would have something on the order of 10,000 first magnitude stars in your sky. So it would give you a lot of, be a lot of stellar astronomers there and not so much uh, on other kinds of Milky Way objects or galaxies, perhaps. Um, now let's go to an area that I know we all love because it's really exciting and really interesting and we have only a fairly short time amount of, amount of time left. Supernovae, what the really massive stars, what, what happens uh, when they uh, perish and, uh, and we need to get to Eta Carinae as well and um, when that becomes a supernova or a hypernova, will it be a danger to us or what about a closer supernova candidate like Betelgeuse? Well, the thing I love about, about, about supernovas, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a rube. I call them supernovas. Uh, <laughs> I prefer that expression, but I don't think I could get away with that with my boss. Well, I, I'll, 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 be, I'll be a rube and just call them supernovas. So supernovas, the, 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 uh, the thing, one of the things I find really cool about it is that it's all about iron. That uh, the you know the the key to understanding why a star explodes is that if you basically look at how atoms are put together, the uh, the iron nucleus is the most it's the most efficient way that you can pack a bunch of particles together. So uh, you know, the sun makes energy by banging together hydrogen into helium, and you get you get a little bit of energy released. And then you can bang helium atoms together, and you can get a little more energy. And then you can even bang together carbon and and oxygen and nitrogen atoms, and you got a little bit of a, a, a little bit of energy comes out. Iron is packed as efficiently as you get, so you can't get out any more energy by by nuclear fusion. Uh, so basically, you know, the, every everything sort of tends toward iron. If you're trying to do fusion or if you're trying to do fission, everything sort of tends toward iron because iron is the most stable thing. It's why there's a lot of iron around. Um, well, once a star starts making iron, it has just it's signed its death sentence. Uh, you build up an iron core, and that iron core can't go anywhere. Uh, you just get more and more. Basically, you just get ash. You, you get iron ash at the center of the star, and when that when that reaches a critical mass that can no longer support its weight, that's when you get a supernova. So it really, you know, it's it's all it's all about the iron. And a lot of the details aren't even known. I mean, exactly how everything kind of implodes and then explodes, the exact movement of um, of the material. Scientists don't know. They try to simulate it, but... Uh, the physical mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. But it's really fun when it does happen, although it doesn't happen all that frequently no. because there are so few of these really incredibly massive stars. Now, how close, before we run out of time here, um, you know, there was a lot of talk about Eta Carinae becoming a hypernova or a supernova, but it's 7,500 light years away. That's a long way away, and, and there have been quite a few studies. Sten Odenwald, in fact, one of our friends and contributors, is someone who's done a lot of studying about what the effects on Earth would be from it uh, at, at that distance, and, and they wouldn't be very uh, critical really, but what about a closer supernova? Because we know there are other candidate stars that eventually will go supernova um, that are closer to us, and Betelgeuse, for example, as I said, is on the order of 500 light years away. That, you know, and there also, there's the issue of gamma ray bursts from other causes uh, in our neighborhood of the galaxy, too. What are, are these dangers to us cosmically out there to a living civilization, and what would those dangers be? Would they, they be neutrinos or blast waves or uh, uh, neutrons in, in large uh, pockets or other particles, and how could they sterilize a living civilization? Uh, well, well, actually, one of the greatest dangers, surprisingly, is, is ionizing radiation that, that destroys the ozone layer. Uh, you know, it, it it sounds you know, com compared to being you know fried by neutrinos, it sounds fairly pedestrian. But but you know the energetic radiation from a from a supernova or hypernova that creates a lot of nitrogen oxides in the upper atmosphere erodes the ozone layer and and then you know a allows all the other radiation to, you know, to get to the Earth's surface. That's actually one of the one of the bigger dangers. You know, I think that, that one of the things that I take some some, you know, the, 
One of the reasons I don't worry about that a whole lot is lots and lots of people have looked for evidence of past extinctions of life on Earth that, that could be tied to a supernova or to a hypernova, and basically they haven't found it. So, which isn't to say, look, you know, a nearby supernova might make life really unpleasant for a few years, but it's probably not going to be the kind of thing that's like wiping out life on Earth. And I have to say, for the record, I think Beetlejuice going supernova would be absolutely awesome to watch in the sky. Yes, it would. It would be a naked eye supernova for us. It'd be a it'd really be more than naked. Yeah, it would be. A, it would be a daytime supernova. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that's what I meant to say. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still still a little uh, jet lagged here. Yes. We are way overdue for a supernova, so here's hoping something happens at a safe distance. Um, but yeah, I think in our own galaxy, it would be pretty cool. Yeah, in the Milky Way, it's been 400 years, so we are due. Um, well, thank you all so much. We're out of time, I'm afraid. So thank you, as always, to Corey Powell. Really enjoyed it today. Thanks, Carrie Farron. What a great job you did. Thank you, Liz Cruzy, as always. Terrific. And I'm Dave Iker. That's all the time that we have this week for our Cosmos Rewind. A special thanks again to Celestron for sponsoring these Google Hangouts. We'll be back next Tuesday to discuss the next episode of Cosmos titled The Lost Worlds of Planet Earth. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Have a great uh, week in the Cosmos. Thank you, Dave.